Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. When Captain Morgan and his buccaneers returned from their raid on Portobello in the late summer of 1668, they found their world once again a very different place. This time it wasn't only Port Royal, it wasn't only the Caribbean, but the balance of power back in Europe had shifted once again, and was still changing in ways that would directly impact the English privateers. All across the globe, the scales of power were shifting. On the European continent, the fallout from the Thirty Years' War was still ongoing, and that strained piece of Westphalia was set to break. Now, they were mostly, if not entirely, holding to the peace, but those tensions were playing out largely in the Caribbean through trade wars, piracy, and even occasionally open naval warfare. In the Caribbean, people were even beginning to fight amongst themselves. Now, once upon a time, all of the powers that weren't Spanish had worked together, all of these allies in the Thirty Years' War, that is, England and France and the Dutch Republic and Sweden, well, they all collaborated to wrest control of the New World from Spain. But now that the Spanish Empire was weak, that collaboration was no longer useful. These allies were now like a pack of hungry dogs growling at each other over the corpse of Spain's empire, and occasionally they would bite. This is episode number 27, Wickedness. Now, two years prior, before Morgan and his men had set out for Portobello, a group of settlers from the island of Bermuda had moved and settled down to an empty little island in the Bahamas. 175 years before that, Christopher Columbus had scouted the island on his first voyage to the New World. In 25 years, that same island and most of the other Bahamanian islands nearby had been completely depopulated of the native population by disease, war, and slavery. For 150 years, this tiny little island had lain empty. It was really a true wilderness. It was that state of untouched wild that made it especially attractive to these Bermudian settlers. It wasn't the natural beauty they were after, though the island certainly had that in abundance. No, it was the massive populations of sea turtles and fish and wildlife that had flourished due to a lack of natural predators. It was the wonderful soil that could provide them with farms and food, and it was also the untold riches in ambergris that had washed up on the shore. It was the trees that they could cut for timber and dyes and medicines. But more than anything else, it was the island's remote nature. This tiny little island was far from any other human habitation. The closest island to them had once housed an English colony, but that had been abandoned long before. Their closest neighbors, when they moved there of any real consequence, were more than a hundred miles away. More to the point, the closest English colony was even farther away, in Jamaica, and they had about as little to do with England as these new Bermudian colonists did. See, these colonists were refugees of a sort. They were staunch Republicans from the Cromwell era that had fled England after the restoration of the Stuart monarchy back there in England, and they believed in things like self-governance and the rule of law, religious freedom, and equal rights. Now, in this day, back in England, the Merry Monarch, King Charles II, was making a mockery of all of those values, and these colonists wanted to escape the long arm of his growing empire. For a time, on this tiny little Bahamanian island, they lived in peace, but not for long. Representatives from the East India Company came to the island to see what these people were about. If the island could be made profitable with the proper application of slavery and sugar plantations, they would. Soon after that, King Charles sent a governor to the island to oversee the transition. The population was probably distressed by the news, and they would have watched his ship's approach warily. Imagine their surprise, though, when his ship crashed into the rocks surrounding their harbor and began to slowly sink into the water of their bay. Then... Imagine their disappointment when the new governor 
an official representative of the king that they had traveled so far to escape, made his way to shore completely unharmed. He claimed, when he crawled out of the ocean, that his survival was God's will, an act of providence, if you like. He declared the island, appropriately, Providence, and to avoid confusion with the old English colony, they called it New Providence Island. There was another perk to living on New Providence Island. That nearby island that had been abandoned, called Eleuthera, had been attacked by the Spanish years before. There were a few men mad enough to stay there that made their living mostly as scavengers and occasionally pirates. These few adventurous men that stayed there stayed because, well, the waters in that part of the Caribbean were, and still are, notoriously difficult to navigate for anybody that doesn't know them well. The trade winds that were bringing ships in from Europe and Africa would frequently carry the ships right into the Bahamas, and sometimes any ship's captain that was foolish enough to try and navigate them would sink, and those ships would leave their cargo on the shallow sea floor. Those Eleutherian scavengers, and then the settlers on New Providence, were known to salvage that cargo and sell it to the highest bidder. Sometimes they were known to fight off any official salvage operation and take the goods for themselves, and sometimes they were even known to kill any survivors of those wrecked ships to ensure that the word never reached their superiors of the ship's fate. Now, when Captain Morgan arrived at home in Port Royal, he would likely have heard about this little island cropping up in the Bahamas and what was happening there, but at the time it was still of very little consequence to him. His first order of business was to see that his cargo was unloaded and that his men were properly paid. As soon as his men began unloading their cargo... Everyone, from the harbor master to the doxies, would have known what a rich haul it was. As each of those doxies tried to catch one of the buccaneers' eyes, they would have seen the fat purses and heard the jingle of hard coin. If not that, the men themselves were likely boasting of the riches that they had won. Word was spreading quickly. Merchants and rum mongers and more and more prostitutes would have been flooding the dock. As boys ran back to town to tell the news that Morgan and his men had arrived, the taverns would have started preparing their wares, the gaming tables were assuring that their dice were properly loaded, and the women that were attractive or skilled enough to afford a room would be applying just a touch of rouge. By the time the ships were finally unloaded, and Morgan himself had begun the trek to the governor's manor, Port Royal would have been a bustle of activity. These men would have been well into their cups, or into a lady's embrace by this point. Probably both. Their purses, even this soon after arriving back in town, would have been significantly lighter, and a fortune was already flowing into Port Royal. You see, this was probably the richest haul that Port Royal had yet seen, and it was the first of any consequence in more than a year. The truly great prices being taken recently had all been taken by French buccaneers under Lolonais, and all of that money went back to Tortuga. For Morgan to have commanded this expedition was a huge boost to his fame and to his renown. And, although nobody knew it yet, Lolonais and Tortuga's days were both numbered. As Morgan made his way through the narrow and cramped streets of Port Royal, Women of every race and disposition would have leaned from their windows to call to him. Now, he was a married man, and he fancied himself an English gentleman, so he wasn't taking part. The sounds coming from all of those windows that a lady wasn't leaning out of would have assured him that his men were. In his book Empire of Blue Water, Stephen Talty gives a brief and honestly beautiful description of the city. He writes, quote, Port Royal was now known as the undisputed western capital of sin. Priests sent to the country reported back on, he quotes another source here, the torrent of wickedness and vice rushing through its streets. Back to Talty. 
The thousands of pounds worth of illicit goods the privateers brought with them would only accelerate this process. Port Royal was now the biggest, wickedest, richest, and most populous city in English America. End quote. He then goes on to tell the tale of one Mary Carleton. Now, it's rare that we get a detailed account of the women that populated the brothels of Port Royal, or really of any city at the time. And although her person and her story are both extraordinary, it does tell us of how she arrived in Jamaica, and I think can tell us a bit about the type of people, other than the buccaneers, that populated the island. Mary Carleton, well, first off, she must have been a woman of unparalleled beauty, and intelligence and cunning. Her first husband was a shoemaker, a cobbler, there in England. They had two children, but both of them died in infancy. So, Mary Carleton skipped town on her husband and married what would be her second husband, a surgeon. When she was found out, she had her first brush with the law, and on the charge of bigamy, she faced trial. It wouldn't be her last. She fled after the trial to Cologne, in Germany, where she caught the eye of a young nobleman. Now this nobleman lavished gifts upon her, and asked again and again for her hand in marriage. The gifts themselves grew richer and richer, and his proposals more insistent. Then in 1663 she escaped once again. This time she fled to London, and this time with all of that extravagant German jewelry. She must have picked up a fair bit of the German language as well, and a convincing accent. She began to frequent taverns, in particular an establishment called The Exchange, and she passed herself off as Princess von Waldway. The princess's story was truly one of woe. Her father, the powerful Lord Henry von Waldway, was pressing her to marry a horrible man, so she fled to London, where she hoped to find a man worthy of her hand in marriage. All of the best lies have a kernel of truth, and this one does the same. She wasn't a princess, of course, but she had fled Germany to escape the unwanted proposals of a man. But imagine her performance. She was a beautiful young woman, sitting alone in a tavern at an empty table. She would have had no shortage of men eager to speak to her. Then, in that German accent with just a hint of regal nature and a shy unwillingness to come forward. The gentleman would likely buy her a drink or two, and a tear would slip from the Princess von Walway's eye. A muffled sob, and then her story in broken English would begin to come forth. Imagine the pity these men must have felt for this princess, penniless, all alone in a foreign land, certainly enough to offer her just a few coins or maybe a glittering trinket. Now in the end, she married the tavern keeper's brother-in-law. It wasn't to last, though. An anonymous letter arrived at the happy husband's door, informing him that the Princess Maria von Walway was really Mary the con artist. She was arrested once again for bigamy, but the letter was dubious in nature, and she argued that she really was a German princess. This was exactly the kind of scandal that London society at the time loved. This was a beautiful young noblewoman in chains held unjustly against her will due to the lies spread to discredit her, or, conversely, a conniving harlot behind bars that duped some poor fool into marrying her guilty of bigamy and theft time and time again. Her trial there in London became a circus. It was attended by the highest members of the London elite. It was attended by the members of the London press, and as many people as the courtroom would hold. It was, for a few days, the biggest story in England, and everyone had an opinion as to her guilt or innocence. The man who was the head of the Navy, Samuel Pepys, firmly believed in the Princess Maria. He even went so far as to visit her in prison and argued for her publicly. The trial, though, quickly 
devolved into something altogether different. If another woman, perhaps a less beautiful woman, had committed the crime of bigamy, she would be convicted, either serve a sentence or pay a fine, boom, case closed, over and done. But this was a beautiful young woman that sold papers and moved pamphlets and plays. She hadn't only, allegedly, committed bigamy, she had impersonated a person of noble birth. This was sensationalist journalism of the highest order, almost modern journalism. In the end, the Princess Maria von Walloway was acquitted and allowed to go about her way. For a time, she capitalized on her fame. She pinned and starred in a play. She wrote her own pamphlets and was the toast of London. As you might expect, she had more than a few admirers. They all offered her gifts, but one of them offered her his hand in marriage, and she accepted. Now many stories would end right here. They lived happily ever after. But this guy, I mean, come on. He is marrying a woman who is famous for allegedly impersonating a princess to con men into marrying her. He's practically begging to be played. Imagine his surprise when he woke up in a drunken stupor one morning to find that Mary and her maid had absconded with all of his money, all of his plate, all of the valuables in the house, and his keys to boot. For the next couple of years, Mary Carleton changed up her act. She left Maria von Walway by the wayside. She was not a princess, but she would change to be a rich heiress, fleeing an unpleasant marriage, and she duped man after man, stealing all she could with her dutiful maid as an accomplice. Her story continued to vary, and she went after smaller marks to keep the heat down, but finally the law did catch up with her again. She was quickly, this time, convicted and sent on a penal ship to the faraway colonial holding on Jamaica. If she planned to find a new life there, she would have been disabused of that notion quickly. You see, she was famous all throughout the empire, even as far away as Jamaica, and the dockside thronged with admirers, even, on occasion, acquaintances, even, on more than a few occasions, former accomplices. You see, Jamaica was now the home of the cream of the English underworld. They were congregating in Port Royal, and finally, Mary Carleton had come to join them. Unfortunately for Mary, she would have found a lot less opportunity in Jamaica. The only men of any real means there knew her for who she was. But she found that if she couldn't defraud men of their coin, there were other means of getting it. As Captain Morgan walked by the brothels lining Port Royals, winding tiny streets, he may have heard Mary Carleton earning a living with one of his men, and perhaps he thought of the words attributed to one of Mary Carleton's many biographers. Quote, A stout frigate she was, or else she never could have endured so many batteries and assaults. A woman of unexampled modesty, if she may be her own herald, but she was as common as a barber's chair. No sooner was one man out, but another was in. Cunning, crafty, subtle, and hot in the pursuit of her intended designs. End quote. Mary Carleton wasn't to end her life in the brothels of Port Royal. She would con her way back into England and disappear into the mists of history. But Captain Morgan, leaving the brothels and the shops of Kill Devil behind, would have continued on into what passed for Port Royal's economic district, their merchant hub. There you could find shops selling everything that a buccaneer could possibly need, There were distillers selling their rum, to be sure. There would have been cobblers selling boots and sandals. There were butchers, grocers, clothiers, hatters, haberdashers, and, of course, blacksmiths. The blacksmiths would have been forging knives for work on board a ship and the crude machetes that passed for cutlasses in the New World. 
These shops sold all that a pirate might need, and certainly relied on the flood of gold that the buccaneers brought in, but the buccaneers weren't the only revenue stream available to these merchants. Those distillers sold the kind of rot-gut rum that the buccaneers preferred, but they also sold the aged and spice varieties, as well as imported European wine. Those same cobblers that sold the pirates their boots and sandals also sold ladies' slippers and gentlemen's shoes. The blacksmiths sold not only crude blades, but farm implements, tools, construction equipment, and the more elegant blades reserved for the more wealthy or influential. You see, it was here in this district that the low lives of Port Royal could mingle with what passed for Jamaican high society. Farmers, merchants, pastors, officers, and officials came here, as did their families. It was a place where wives and daughters, accompanied by husbands, fathers, or at the very least a stout servant entrusted with her protection, would come to shop, come to mingle, and perhaps catch a glimpse of one of these rogues. It was a place also where one of those rogues, flush with cash and, hopefully, freshly bathed, might be able to entice one of those ladies to sneak off with him. That would be a dicey proposition, and unlikely to succeed, but pirates were notorious gamblers. However, if the lady's guardian didn't catch them, one of the myriad shopkeeps or one of their guards were likely to. This district wasn't just merchants and their shops, though. There were warehouses as well. Not the dockside variety, but those of the English and Jewish merchants on the island, as well as, probably a clandestine, Dutch West India Company warehouse. Now these would have been bustling with activity as well, mostly sending representatives to the docks to see just what the pirate crews had brought to town. Now Port Royal may have been the most sinful of England's New World cities, but by this time, some twelve years after the English and Captain Morgan had come to the island, the old Spanish capital of Jamaica, Villa de la Vega, was being rebuilt and was re-inhabited. The English called it Spanish Town, and it was a refuge for the less seedy, more cultured of the island's residents. The Assembly and Governor Modi Ford lived and met in Spanish Town. The old Jewish families of Jamaica largely lived there as well, though their interests were still in Port Royal. Certainly, all of the plantations that were on Jamaica were centered around Spanish Town, and even Captain Morgan's own home was there. He may have been the pirate lord of the Caribbean, but he owned a sugar plantation. He had a wife and a family to take care of as well. Now, Spanish Town was certainly Morgan's eventual destination. He would have been expected to debrief the governor upon his return, and was likely eager to see his wife and children. Now, if Morgan had been carrying serious news, he would have gone directly to the governor's manor, but he wasn't, so it was likely he went home first. His wife, Elizabeth, and their children, along with Morgan's several cousins that were living there on Jamaica, would have greeted him in that warm but severely proper fashion of the old world British. But in the end, the governor was still waiting, and the Morgans were expected for dinner that evening. Around the table, Admiral Morgan would have regaled the company with the tales of his exploits, excluding the more vivid descriptions of his voyage. This was exactly the type of swashbuckling adventure that, well, Disney loves to tell, full of heroic acts, dashing charm, and English courage. This would entertain everyone at the table without offending the sensitive ears of the women and children while still giving the governor and any other officials present time to mull over what had happened on Morgan's voyage. Now, after dinner, the men would retire to the parlor for rum and cigars, and, more importantly, to talk seriously of what had really happened on Morgan's voyage. All of the death and the carnage of the raid on Portobello would have been shared, all of the spoils taken and the cost incurred. Especially of interest to this crowd were the possible diplomatic effects of the voyage. See, the situation in Europe, and to a lesser extent in the Caribbean, had changed once again 
Morgan himself was actually a factor in some of these changes this time, but this was his first chance to learn of how things now stood. When the buccaneers had left for their raid, the English were still embroiled in the Second Anglo-Dutch War, and King Charles had actually ordered Governor Modiford to focus any privateer actions on Dutch colonies in the Caribbean. The buccaneers, though, saw things differently, as usual, and they attacked the Spanish, as usual. Now, they weren't instrumental to the conflict, but their obstinacy must have annoyed the king. The Dutch went on to attack the English at the Naval Battle of Medway, and then the English attacked a French naval squadron in the Caribbean at the Battle of Martinique, at the time the French and the Dutch were allied. This was actually a fairly major class, though still very gentlemanly in execution, and altogether not how the Jamaicans did things. In the end, all of the belligerents signed a treaty, granting the English holdings in the Spice Islands to the Dutch and the Dutch colony of New Netherland to the English. The capital at New Amsterdam was renamed New York in honor of the Duke of York, and the Second Anglo-Dutch War was ended. Now this would all probably have been news to Morgan, but more to the point was the new war. You see, the Sun King, Louis the Fourteenth of France, was pushing his weight around back in Europe, and now England and the Netherlands, and even Spain, were at war with France. Now, history would call this the War of Devolution, due to King Louis's assertion that his wife's claim on the Spanish Netherlands had devolved to her despite her having given it up. The reality was that King Louis finally wanted to put on his big boy pants and decided to invade a country or two. Now, King Louis wasn't a soldier, and he wasn't a commander. His generals made all of the decisions on the battlefield. However, Louis did bring his press corps with him to chronicle all of his great deeds, though there really weren't any, and to paint him looking heroic on battlefields that his men had died to secure. The rest of Europe, though, wasn't having any of this, and they all allied to knock King Louis down a peg or two. This is just another European war. They had a lot of these during the 17th and 18th centuries, and as yet, it's not important to our story. Now, Captain Morgan and Governor Modiford weren't concerned with European kings and their squabbles. To them, Spain was still the real enemy. They were still somewhere amassing the Windward Fleet to attack them. That is, unless those squabbles of European kings somehow impacted them. And this one, as it turned out, was about to. At first, in what would seem like a big impact, but as Henry Morgan would eventually discover, the war would impact him personally in ways he would not see coming. But that's for the future. Meantime, that head naval official back in England, Samuel Pepys, was busy building up England's navy. He was responsible for the massive ships of the line being built and the newly regimented naval squadrons being put to sea. As a consequence to all of this naval build-up, the English had quite a few older warships sitting around that they could use to bolster defenses on some of their smaller colonies. Jamaica, the governor had learned, was going to be the new port of call of one of these ships, the Oxford. The communique from England read, The Oxford was gifted to Modiford, quote, For the defense of His Majesty's plantation of Jamaica and suppressing the insolence of privateers upon the coast. End quote. <laughs> that wasn't exactly what Modiford or Morgan had in mind. You see, the governor had no navy. They had no shipyard in Jamaica. What they did have was that ragtag group of buccaneers that knew how to sail. But they didn't sail in defense. With the threat of Spain looming, the governor and Morgan agreed that the best defense was a good offense, and another strike against Spain was called for. So, once his men were arrested, Morgan was to sail again and prepare another attack on Spain. It wouldn't be long before his men were ready to sail. It was said of the buccaneers and... This really rings true for pirates of all ages. Quote, a cask of rum, 
a deck of cards or a dice box, an opulent harlot with skilled caresses, and these rascals, devils to the Spaniards, became children to be gold in expert hands. End quote. Once their money ran out, and the prostitutes had no more interest to them, and then their debtors started looking for repayment, all of the buccaneers were once again ready to sail. Hopefully, Morgan had a few days to spend with his family in peace, but soon the fleet was once again anchored off Cow Island, waiting for other buccaneer crews to join them. The ships began to trickle in. It was the usual mix of Englishmen, French, Dutch, runaway slaves, and Indians. There were escaped indentured servants or former Navy officers. There were the sons of disgraced noblemen and the sons of prostitutes. What they were wasn't important. Now they were free men. Well, for the most part, they were free. One French crew in the fleet wasn't so lucky. After a few days at anchor, a warship sailed into view. It was a 300-ton fifth-rate frigate that carried 34 guns and a crew of 160 men. Now, compared to the first and second-rate ships of the line, this frigate wasn't much, but it was a real English man-of-war, not some leaky, converted Spanish merchant ship. Now, the ship flew English colors. It was, at last, the Oxford. However, it wasn't yet to become Morgan's flagship. Her master, one Captain Collier, informed Morgan, who was his admiral, that he had been sent by Governor Modiford on an important assignment. One of the French ships in the fleet at Cow Island was accused of piracy against an English ship, and the crew had to be brought back to Port Royal for trial. There is some question of the legitimacy of this claim. The captain of the French vessel certainly denied the charges, but facing down the Oxford, he really couldn't argue too forcefully. So the crew of his ship was taken back to Port Royal and tried on charges of high seas piracy. They were then convicted and sentenced to execution. They didn't hang, though. The governor commuted their sentence, but he still commandeered their vessel, La Cerf Volant. All of this rings false to me for a number of reasons. You see, La Cerf Volant was one of the best ships among the French buccaneers in Morgan's fleet. It carried 24 cannon and a total of 12 brass swivel guns. After it had been commandeered, it was rechristened the Satisfaction and put under command of Captain Collier, the very man that had captured her. Remember, right now, England was embroiled in that war of devolution against France. The buccaneers essentially operated outside of these petty national rivalries, but the French governor of Tortuga couldn't exactly lodge a complaint against Modifort. After all, the diplomatic channels were limited in a time of war, and a charge of piracy was still entirely possible. It seems likely, though, to me, that Moody Ford was committing an act of officially sanctioned piracy, claiming the best French ship in Morgan's fleet for Jamaica in a time when France couldn't really do anything about it. So the Oxford sailed in the company of the new ship The Satisfaction for Cow Island and the buccaneer fleet of Captain Morgan. When they arrived, the command of the Oxford was given over to Captain Morgan, and the captains of all the crews in attendance gathered on board the Oxford to discuss their plans. It was here they likely found out about the death, or at least the disappearance, of Francois Lolonnais. The implication wouldn't have been lost on Morgan. He was now ostensibly the ranking pirate in the Caribbean. First up, though, were the formalities, the ratification of the code. They were the usual terms, and Morgan was once again voted commander-in-chief of the operation. Then they got down to brass tacks. Where exactly were they going to attack? The usual suggestions were bandied about. Havana, Santo Domingo, Campeche, maybe. But no, Captain Morgan had a better plan. There was a place through which most of the Inca silver flowed on the Spanish main. It was well defended, but not as strongly as Havana. It was Cartagena. With the Oxford and the Satisfaction, the buccaneers had enough strength to sail on Cartagena in force. It was rich, it was fat, and it was not expecting a raid on the scale Morgan had in mind. 
The captains all agreed. It was, in truth, a splendid target. So every man in the fleet, every one of the captains, signed his name to the plan, and they all retired to Captain Morgan's cabin on the Oxford to open a cask of rum and toast their next expedition. Exquamellon, or at least his later English translators, says that the pirates drank to the health of the King of England, which I truly doubt was the case, but it sure sold Morgan as the kind of English hero that the publishers wanted him to be. Then the author goes on, quote, The buccaneer captains toasted their good success and fired off salvos. The gentlemen made merry in the poop, and the men did the same in the forecastle. But when they were in the height of their joy, events swiftly changed to a sorrowful conclusion. For, as the festive guns were being fired, some sparks landed in the gunpowder, and the ship blew up with three hundred Englishmen on board. End quote. Exquamellon, as usual, gets a number of the facts wrong in his account. He claimed that their destination was an island that was expecting a Spanish treasure fleet, which it wasn't. He calls the pirates gentlemen, which they weren't. And he goes on to say that all of the officers survived. But they didn't. In the cabin, while they were drinking to their future success, Morgan didn't sit at the head of the table, as you might expect. He sat on the starboard side of the table. On his side, he shared it with Captains Collier, a man named Captain Brown, and John Morris the Elder. On the opposite side of the table sat Captains Bigford, Whitting, Thornbury, Aylett, and John Morris the Younger. When the magazine exploded, all of the men in the great cabin were launched into the air. The men on Morgan's side of the table were thrown into the water, surrounded by falling, flaming debris. Those on the opposite side, though, were struck by the falling mainmast, or else flung deeper into the burning and quickly sinking vessel. Immediately, the other ships in the fleet sent out boats to rescue any survivors they could find. Of the regular crew, only two cabin boys are mentioned in the histories. They also pulled out Captains Collier and Brown. They pulled out John Morris the Elder, who was one of Morgan's earliest lieutenants. His son, unfortunately, was not rescued. Then, after some panic and frantic searching, they spotted a bleeding Captain Morgan and pulled him into their boat. He was dazed, and he was losing blood, but he was still breathing. The same cannot be said for the other 300 men on board the Oxford. Their job now was to rescue any men they could, salvage any guns or goods they could from the Oxford, and then they realized that without their largest warship, they were going to need to come up with an entirely new plan. Because their original plan had quite literally gone up in flames, nobody knew where the pirates were going to go, and so the Spanish were unable to anticipate. There was a man who was, at this point, on the hunt for Captain Morgan, now the most famous and feared buccaneer in the Caribbean, and he would track down Captain Morgan at his next destination. Next time, we're going to follow in the footsteps of that Spanish officer on his hunt for Captain Henry Morgan. Thank you for listening, and a special thanks to Garrett Coleman, our quartermaster from over at Patreon, and all of the other officers and crew that help support the show. A special thanks as well to everybody that has donated to the show through our PayPal button, and anybody who has been kind enough to leave a review over at iTunes or wherever it is you happen to listen to the show. Listen to the